Hello and welcome to this video, which is going to be all about the new balance changes that have been made in the Forgotten Empires and in the African Kingdoms. Now, the game is going to be updated from version 4.3 to version 4.4. .4. These balance changes are going to affect all of the existing AOF civilizations, and they will, of course, um, affect the new African Kingdom's civilizations as well. These are changes which, across the board, should help to balance the game and make it a little bit more even between certain civilizations. It's worth noting that these balance changes are not going to affect the base game, so unless you're playing with the uh, AOF expansion or the African Kingdoms expansion, these changes will not come into effect at all. Now, these changes are pretty varied, there's quite a lot of them, and uh, some of the themes are pretty similar, and we'll talk about that as we go through. But I want to cover all of these changes before I do any in-depth looks at the new African Kingdom's civilizations, so you guys can get a, a broader understanding of the general changes that are out there first. So let's go through, and what I'll do is talk a little bit about certain changes that I, you know, I, I kind of have thoughts on and opinions on. Now, the first set are going to be changes that affect all civilizations and to begin with that's the eagle warrior upgrade cost has been reduced by 100 food i think since the forgotten empires introduced the eagle warrior upgrade from eagle scout um, a lot of people have been not getting eagles as much or in the castle age and so i think that change there is to try and encourage a little bit more eagle warrior use in the castle age by making that upgrade a little bit cheaper They've also increased the Eagle Warrior speed a tiny amount. I don't think that's really worth mentioning uh, or doing much about. But this next change is that the Eagle Scout is available from the Feudal Age. And this is a really cool one because it actually gives the Meso civilizations a little bit more option in the Feudal Age uh, for what military built units they want to make. Generally speaking, most Mesoamerican civilizations, since they don't get cavalry, are basically limited to making archers. Either that or they make mana arms, which generally don't get get seen anyway. And so the Eagle Scout is just there as a new option now, and I think that's going to be really cool. Before you could only make them in the Castle Age, now you can make them in the Feudal Age, and I think that that's a really good change, to be honest with you. It's certainly going to shake the meta game up a little bit, and it should make the Mesoamerican civilizations a little bit more entertaining to play. The next one is that the fire galleys and demolition rafts are newly added to the Feudal Age, and we've spoke about these already. They're basically um, weaker versions of the fire ship and the demolition ship, clearly, and they actually are aimed at rebalancing the Feudal Age water so that you actually have a choice, because before, you only had the choice of galley. There was no choice available to you. And I think one thing that really makes RTS games uh, awesome is that it gives the players lots of choices and in the Feudal Age before there was no choice whatsoever now you have a choice of three different ships and I expect we might see some players making fire galleys instead of um, standard galleys to begin with and then the, the water metagame can become a bit more diverse and depending on the outcome of the Feudal Age the Castle Age will also be less predictable because there may be a lot of fire galleys out already and then you might want to start making some demolition ships in the Castle Age or maybe even some standard fire ships in the Castle Age. So I love that change and uh, obviously in this video we're just going through these changes but I will be making another video soon about the African Kingdoms that will demonstrate these boats in action and all of that good stuff. Siege Towers are now added to the Castle Age, that's the same for AOF as well, it's worth pointing out. Uh, obviously these guys are not going to be in the base game in AOC, but they will be in, uh, in the Forgotten and they will be in African Kingdoms. But we've already looked at the Siege Towers, so I'm not going to speak too much about those guys. Next up, banking and coinage research time increased from 50 seconds to 70 seconds, and the next two changes also make banking and, uh, and coinage more expensive by adding... Uh, 100 food and 100 gold to banking and adding 50 food and 50 gold to coinage. Now the idea of these three changes is simply to nerf slinging a little bit and to be honest with you I don't think slinging is a huge problem in AOEHD because the level of players generally not slinging each other. Um, it's generally you know a high level strategy to do that and it's usually used in um, really high-end team games which you don't see so much of on AOEHD. But the sentiment is there, and the idea is to just 
reduce the power of stinging a little bit, and I'm glad that they've introduced that in regardless. Next one is that the Cavalry Archer cost has been reduced to 40 wood and 60 gold across the board, and this is basically a buff and a nerf. Um, it buffs all, all civilizations because the Cavalry Archer is cheaper, but it does slightly nerf the Hun Cavalry Archer bonus, since the Cavalry Archer's costing less means that their bonus reduces the price by less. So I think that's a really good change, and I totally agree with that 100%. Next is to trade cogs carry 30% more gold per trip. And I think this is something that's actually a really good idea because how often do we see trade cogs? We, we just don't. Um, they're really kind, they're very bad. Let's be honest, they're very bad units. And generally speaking, players would rather set up a land trade route on a water map, which just goes to show how bad the trade cogs are. So by giving them a little bit more gold capacity, I think that's a really good idea. And it will actually make the water become really more valuable in the Imperial Age when you can actually trade on it as well. The next change is really cool, and that's that transport ships can now carry herdable animals, which basically means you can load up some uh, some goats, you can load up some sheep, you can load up, um, what else is there, Tur uh, not turkeys, yeah, turkeys, sorry, uh, I was thinking, I was getting confused between ostriches and turkeys, you know, easily done. <laughs> but yeah, transport ships can carry herdable animals, I think that's a really cool thing, and um, I, I really like that change a lot. Uh, it's certainly going to make those maps where you start on a small patch of land with a few sheep really interesting, because it gives you the option to actually grab the sheep and, and up and go and take the sheep with you so you're not going to actually risk too much by leaving your starting island. The next one is a buff to fire ships and fast fire ships. Fire ships have more armor and ship armor, same for fast fire ships as well. And again, I think this is an important and needed change to help balance the water. Um, you might notice some of these changes fairly similar to the balance tweaker, only this time they're being made official, which is really nice. And, uh, you know, we've already tested out the fire ships when they've been buffed, and they actually do start to counter galleys a little better. And that's the important thing, making fire ships a little more viable, but not making them too overpowered. And I think that change does exactly that. Scorpion projectile size is increased, and uh, this is an interesting one. I'm not entirely sure exactly how it works, but basically the idea is that scorpions, when they hit the first target, they do that full damage, and then they, when they pass through that target, the projectile doesn't seem to, to do as much damage, doesn't seem to really do that much damage to the units behind it, and by increasing the projectile size, the idea is that it's going to do more damage to the units behind it, and actually make that uh, that gimmick, I suppose, of passing through enemies a little more useful, and actually make the scorpions a little better, which I think is a needed change, because scorpions are fairly weak. The next one is kind of interesting. Camels are no longer classified as ships. And this is kind of a strange one because the reason why camels were so bad at raiding before is because they were classed as ships. And due to being classed as ships, TCs, towers, castles, all of those things that the stationary buildings, defenses, that fire arrows, do additional damage versus camels. Now this is going to make camels better at raiding, this is going to make camels a little more tanky actually, underneath that town centre fire. And what I'll have to do is I'll have to do a test to see how tanky the new camels are going to be with this change. It's actually a really, really big change. You know, it might not seem like it, it might be like, oh well camels are not ships anyway, so this is not going to make any difference. But it actually is, it's going to make camels much stronger. And I will want to actually do a test to see if the new camels are going to be that much better. Uh, we'll find out. I'll, you know, I'll do that right now. I'll do that in the scenario editor uh, right now. We'll have a look. So here we are in the scenario editor, and we're going to be testing the heavy camel and the cavalier attacking a dark age TC. Now the yellow town center does five damage per arrow and fires five arrows, so it should be doing one damage per arrow, and you can see that here on the cavalier uh, taking five damage per volley due to it having four or more pierce armor. The heavy camel has four pierce armor, however, it takes ten damage per volley, which means that there is still some bonus damage being done by the TC. Now although the camel is no longer classified as a ship, it appears that buildings still do bonus damage. In this situation, the town center uh, will do one bonus damage. The re that's the reason why each arrow was doing an additional one damage when versus the cavalier, uh, each arrow was just doing a, a flat one damage. So 
I think then that this means that camels will still not be as strong at, at raiding. They're certainly going to be a lot better at raiding since TCs used to do something like five bonus damage and now they only do one. Um, and that's actually a really interesting point and I think this is really going to make camels a lot, lot better. The final change is pretty inconsequential. Fish traps take 40 seconds to build instead of 60 seconds. That's just, yeah, whatever. That doesn't really make too much difference as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so moving on now to the um, bonuses for the individual civilizations. So the Franks. Now, if you guys watched my uh, my video on the worst five civilizations, you'll know that the Franks featured in there. Now, the Franks are really the one-trick pony in this game. They are very predictable. They only really go for that those knights that their, their strength is only in their heavy cavalry and uh, they're not really got much else outside of that to be honest so knights it's it, their knight bonus story has been changed it's not 20 hp bonus to knights it's 20 hp bonus to cavalry and that is good because that's going to buff their light cavalry a little bit and that, i think that's a really good thing because obviously you know the franks Although they get some of the best knights in the game, they get some of the worst light cavalry in the game due to not having bloodlines, and they don't get Hussar. So the Franks light cavalry really suck, and that plus 20 HP to cavalry is intended, I believe, to, you know, to just to buff those light cavalry a little bit and give the Franks maybe a little more option when gold is running low. The next change is that elite throwing axemen are a little bit faster. So that's basically going to make them... A little better, but I don't know how much better they're going to be, to be honest with you, with that chain. Now onto the Huns. The Huns, they have been nerfed a little bit, with the Cavalry Archer cost reduction being reduced. So basically that means that their Cavalry Archers will cost more. Um, now they cost minus 10% in the Castle Age and minus 20% in the Imperial Age, instead of minus 25 and minus 30 so this is kind of a, a very big change, actually. That's 15% more expensive in the Castle Age and 10% more expensive in the Imperial Age. But I like the idea here. Now, since the uh, Cavalry Archer has been reduced in price anyway, I think that it's okay to change these values a little more than, than if you'd have kept the Cavalry Archer price the same because it's going to mean that uh, the Hunt Cavalry Archers are still actually pretty cheap and they're affordable anyway. Um, but... I think it's also important to note that the difference between the Castle Age and Imperial Age reduction before this change was only 5%, but now the difference is 10%. So it's going to make the, the Cavalry Archers not so overpowered in the Castle Age, but it's also going to allow their bonus to continue into the Imperial Age and make those Cavalry Archers very strong there as well. So the next change for the Huns is that Marauders has been reduced in price by, uh, well, it's actually been changed a lot. It's not even been reduced in price from food. It's changed from 500 food and 200 gold to 300 wood and 200 gold. So it's completely swapped out that food cost for a wood cost, and it's reduced it by 200 as well. Now, Marauders is the Castle Age technology for the Huns, which allows you to create Tarkins from the stable. And basically, it saw no use, because Tarkins are kind of... The Tarkins are not that great in the Castle Age anyway. In the Imperial Age, they're actually pretty decent, but you've got to consider here that Marauders was pretty expensive for what it is. 500 food and 200 gold is quite a lot when the units you're creating all also cost food and gold. 500 food especially is, is on the high end. So by changing that food to wood, it makes it a lot more affordable because as a Hun player making knights or Tarkins, you're not spending that wood on your military. So you're more likely to have a surplus and you can get this technology fairly comfortably in theory. Now this is a change that you'll see actually in, in a bunch of these sieves now. The Castle Age technology reduced in price and that's just to make them more viable because I think the dev team felt like Many people weren't utilizing their, their civilization's Castle Age technologies enough. And the thing with the Castle Age technology as well is that it is situational. And, you know, you're not going to see the Huns doing Marauders every game. But it is an option. And the, the, the whole concept here with these second unique technologies is to give civilizations more options. And that's exactly what you know, they're going to be able to do with the reduced price here. So that, in my opinion, is a good change, and I'm in favor of reducing the price of the Castle Age technologies across the board, really. 
So next up, the three eyes. Now, these guys, the Incas, the Indians, and the Italians. Three of the five new civilizations in the Forgotten. And a lot of people felt that these civilizations were underpowered. They needed something, because I think many people would agree that the Forgotten Empire's team were quite, uh, quite cautious in the creation of these new civilizations. They didn't want to make something that was too strong, too overpowered, and so they held back a little bit. But with these balance changes, it's in theory going to give these three civilizations something uh, to really knock them up a gear and actually make them pretty useful. So the Incas, first of all, Couriers now gives plus one, plus two armor instead of 10% movement speed. Couriers, of course, was the unique technology of the Incas to buff their eagle warriors. Now, everyone that you will speak to will generally agree that the Incas' eagle warriors are the weakest in the game compared to the Mayans and the Aztecs. The Aztecs' plus 4 attack and the Mayans getting the extra HP is far superior to a 10% movement speed buff. So they've changed it, and now the Couriers gives uh, more armor to the Eagle Warriors. Now this is really cool because it's actually going to allow them to raid, much like the other Eagle Warriors from the other civilizations. And um, yeah, I, I like that change. I think that's a good one. The Incas also receive keep, they receive guilds, they receive block printing, they receive thumb ring, and their slingers no longer require a castle. So I'm just powering through these changes here uh, for these guys because, to be honest with you, keeps guilds and block printing is kind of niche um, things really, and it's not worth talking too much about that. Thumb ring, on the other hand, is a good thing because it's going to make their arbalest more viable, and I think that's another thing that Inca players felt like, you know, really... It really hurt them. Uh, thumb ring just, it, it's an important tech when you have a civilization that may need to fall back onto archers. Also, slingers no longer requiring a castle is another change that you're going to see kind of across the board here. Those secondary unique units now no longer requiring castles, it's really going to shake the metagame a little bit. It's, you know, if you're being attacked by a lot of infantry, you're not prepared, then you're going to be able to get those slingers out, and you don't need a castle to do that, which, you know, can really screw you over if, if you need a castle, and you're like, oh, crap, I don't have a castle. I better throw a castle down so I can make this unit. Don't have to do that anymore. The slingers available, of course, from the archery range, acting like a hand cannoneer, and um, that's actually going to make the slingers quite strong because you don't require chemistry to, to make them anymore. So I like that change a lot. Moving on to the Indians. The Indians' villagers now uh, cost t minus 10% in the Dark Age, minus 15% in the Feudal Age, minus 20% in the Castle Age, and they're 25% cheaper in the Imperial Age. This is an additional 5% per age versus what they were before. So this means that villagers will be cheaper across the board for the Indians, and Again, I think a lot of players really kind of thought that the, the Indian bonus, it just wasn't enough, you know, that they didn't feel like it had that much impact on the game. And now with an extra 5% reduction per age, I think that actually will start to make the Indians a little more competitive, you know, really buff their economy a little more, which is what they really needed, I felt. They also receive guilds, we're not going to talk about that. They receive ring archer armor, and uh, I think that's an interesting one, because that's going to really buff their elephant archers, and you'll see down here that the elephant archers have received a lot of changes. The castle age elephant archer has been given plus 30 HP, and the elite elephant archer has been given minus 20 HP. So that means that it's going to have a net gain of 10 HP uh, for elite, and a net gain of 30 HP for the standard elephant archer. And I, I agree with this change a lot because I felt like the Castle Age Elephant Archers were just rubbish. And I think a lot of people feel the same way about, about the Elephant Archers. I think many people agree that they they just don't have that oomph factor. They don't have that oomph factor. And uh, giving them the extra HP in the Castle Age is very good. Giving them that overall 10 HP bonus at Elite is very good. Uh, they do get minus one pierce armor, but since they get ring archer armor, that is going to actually give them an additional pierce armor uh, versus what they had before. So they're going to become a little less, uh, a little more tanky, sorry. And they also cost less food, uh, minus 10 food cost, which uh, actually puts them at 100 food and 80 gold, which is going to be a very reasonable price when you consider that the Indian villagers now cost less as well. So it's actually going to be affordable to make elephant archers in theory. 
Moving on to the Italians then, and uh, the Condottiero is uh, no longer requiring a castle to create, similarly to the Slingers. And uh, the idea here, of course, is again that you can make them in the barracks, so why do you need a castle to be able to unlock them? And I, I, again, I like that change. I, I think that's good. Uh, they've also received some buffs to the Condottero as well, with plus one attack and plus 0 0.2 speed. And the thing here is that the Condottero, it doesn't really work as well as it should against gunpowder. It's supposed to counter gunpowder units, but as it stands, it kind of dies a little too quickly. So by giving them a bit more speed, they're able to close the gap to the gun uh, to the gunpowder units a little faster, and the plus one attack should help them to take them down a little faster as well. And since it doesn't require a castle, you can even make them earlier on if you like. I don't know why you'd want to make them. Um, they're not that great for anything else, but it's an option, and players should have options. <laughs> they also get hussars, and I think this is a really big one because again, the Italians really lacked just something. And by giving them hussars now, it's actually going to give them a little bit of raiding capability in the Imperial Age, and it's going to allow them to flesh out and pad out their army a little bit as well because their light cavalry just they, they just weren't good enough. So hussar now for the Italians should make them a little better in the Imperial Age and give them a bit more viability. Pavise now affects all foot archers instead of just the Genoese crossbow. And this is a good one because it means that all foot archers are going to now get the, the, the extra defense. And the reason that's good is because if the Italians lost their castles, then they lost one of their most powerful units, essentially. Those Genoese crossbow are really good, but you have to have the castles up to be able to create them. By Pavise affecting all foot archers, you can even consider making just going straight into, you know, Arbalest kind of build order and using Pavise just to buff them. And again, more options available, and I like that a lot. They've also reduced the cost of Pavise a lot by uh, reducing it by 100, 250 food, sorry, and 150 gold. So that's a big saving right there. And it's also very good that it costs food here or costs less food because. Of course, if you're making archers, you're making crossbows, you're using gold and wood, and the food should be in surplus. So it makes sense to have it like that. Uh, advancing to the next stage is now 15% cheaper instead of 10%. So generally speaking, massive buffs there for the Italians. In fact, I'd say they were probably the, the most buffed civilization of the three eyes from the uh, Forgotten Empires. And uh, I think the Italians are now going to be really very good. It's just a, a small number of changes here, but I think that's actually going to make them a very strong civilization. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to, interesting, sorry, to see with that cheaper advancing time, if they are going to become more aggressive. And, uh, you know, I'd love to see some really aggressive Italian play utilizing perhaps a, a castle drop and provides to buff their archers and just I think that'd be really awesome to see so Italians really good stuff moving on to the Japanese Yasama which is the tech that allows the Japanese towers to fire more arrows has been reduced in price by 100 wood it's a very small change it's not uh, not that big overall but it's worth noting that since arrow slits is a new technology available, which buffs the watchtower, guard tower, and keep, that's actually going to make the uh, Yasama technology even stronger, really, than it was before. So by reducing this, it's going to make it so that players actually consider it as an option, and it's also going to actually buff the technology as well. Koreans, the turtle ship no longer requires the castle, so again, that's another situation where the secondary unique unit doesn't require the castle anymore. And that, again, is so cool because the turtle ship, you never see it. You never really see it because who wants to build a castle when they're playing a water map? When everything is focused around the water and attacking on the water. Now you've got the options as the Koreans to actually make some turtle ships without needing that castle first. And it's all about opening up possibilities, giving the players more options. And uh, I think that's such a cool change. And it's also going to make the water game even more entertaining since we've already got the buffed fires and the the fire ships and the, the demolition ships in the feudal age now we're going to get turtle ships in the castle age and you'll see as well later on that the viking longboats don't need the castle either which means even the viking players can go straight into the longboats as well the Korean unique technology, Panoxion, I believe that's how it's said, uh, has also been reduced in cost, a minus 100 wood and a minus 100 food change. 
that basically buffs their turtle ships by giving them more movement speed and that's one of the things that really holds the turtle ship back as well the movement speed is so slow it just takes them years to get across the map so that technology should in theory again become more viable and similar themes with these changes but i really like the direction of them and yeah i don't know if that's really going to get that much use to be honest because you're still going to need the castle to do that and if you're making turtle ships without the castle then you're not going to build a castle just to make your turtle ships move a bit faster but it is an option there for the players and uh, since it's reduced in price a little bit i think we may see players considering it a little more and it's just it's about giving that option to the players there and making them consider do i want this technology will this technology actually help me out uh, rather than thinking okay well i've got to get this technology because it's there but it's a bit expensive so i think i'll just leave it every time now it's like okay it's actually a reasonable price i might just get it and consider making some turtle ships so moving on to the mines and the obsidian arrow technology now does plus six damage instead of plus four so a plus two damage increase obsidian arrows is the unique technology in the castle age for the mines that makes their archers crossbows and arbalest do additional damage versus buildings it's a technology that rarely sees any use but now it's been buffed a little bit i do wonder whether or not it's actually going to be a viable tech. Will you start seeing the Mayan players massing up Arbalest? Probably not, but it is an option once you have a good number of crossbows perhaps to do this technology and start hammering away at your opponent's buildings, tearing them down very quickly. And I'll be interested to see just how quickly they do tear buildings down with this technology now being buffed up to 6 damage. The Mayans are also one of the few civilizations to get a small nerf and you'll notice that most of this list is buffs and I think that's the right way to go about it. But there does have to be some nerfs sometimes and that's basically here going to be the uh, resource longer lasting reduced by 5% from 20 to 15. And uh, you know the Mayans economy is a very strong thing and that longer lasting resources is an insanely good economy buff you know. It's going to give, it gives the mines so much longevity in the game. It makes them every single bit of gold uh, last so much longer. Every, every, everything across the board lasts so much better. It's a huge eco bonus. So reduced to 15% just to nerf the mines, which are one of the strongest civilizations in the game, no doubt. The Slavs change is... Uh, pretty complicated sounding it, essentially it means that the slavs farmers are going to be able to farm faster that's all there is to it um, but no that's kind of an interesting change the slabs are a very food intensive civilization they do of course require a lot of food for their infantry a lot of food for their boyar um so it, it's kind of you know it's, it's a it's a useful thing to have this farming boat boost but I think players felt like it wasn't enough before so now having a little bit better farming is going to uh, hopefully make them a little easier to play I, I guess I think the slabs are a difficult civilization to play well um, and you know they're gonna need so much they need such a huge economy all of their technology is so expensive on the food front and yeah this is a good change in my opinion Moving on to the Spanish then, and again you'll see that those missionaries now no longer require a castle, and you never ever see missionaries, you just don't, but that's because you needed a castle to build them, so now the Spanish missionaries can come into play uh, instead of monks perhaps. Inquisition cost has changed from 400 food and 400 gold to 300 gold and 100 food, which is a huge difference. That's uh, They've kind of got it the wrong way around here, but it's minus 300 food and minus 100 gold. So it actually becomes really cheap on the food front, and uh, the gold cost, even 300 gold, is fairly reasonable, to be honest with you. Inquisition, of course, is the Spanish unique technology in the Castle Age, which increases the monk conversion rate. And, you know, with the cost being 300 gold, you might think that's you know, a little expensive on the gold front. But if you're going into monks, you're generally taking a lot of gold anyway. And that's actually a really, really reasonably priced technology when you consider the other monastery technologies and how expensive some of those ones are. The monk conversion rate, of course, is basically meaning that your monks will convert things faster and that is going to make the, the Spanish so good especially now they can make missionaries in the castle age as well without needing that castle first. 
We're nearly at the end now, but the Teutons are next, and uh, this again will affect the uh, unique technology in the Castle Age. This is ironclad. The cost has been reduced by just a hundred wood, so a very small change, but it is a, a change which should also make the ironclad technology more viable. It should give players that option and make them actually think about the tech rather than just glossing over it. Ironclad, of course, is that uh, unique technology in the Castle Age, which gives the Teuton Siege a little bit more armor. Finally, moving along to the Vikings, and you'll see that those long boats no longer require the castle, which should uh, also make the, the water more varied in that Castle Age, with the Vikings now being able to make long boats and the uh, Koreans now being able to make turtle ships. So I think that's a cool change, and it's actually going to give the Vikings some more options. Bear in mind, of course, that the Vikings don't get fire ships, so they could even now go into long boats straight away instead of doing it war galleys if they wanted to. The longbow co uh, long boat cost has been restored to 100 wood and 50 gold, and uh, that's what it used to be in AOC. So obviously that since you can make the longboat in the castle age now, the cost is more expensive. You know, it's 10 more wood and it's 20 more gold to make a longboat than it costs to make a galley. So it that's a kind of nerf, I guess, you know, that's going to make the longboats a little more expensive. But since you can make them in the Castle Age, you know, you got you got to weigh up, is that worth it? Um, I'd say actually that the, the longboat cost there my opinion may be a little too much. I do feel like the longboats might be a little expensive. Finally, then, for the Vikings, and the final change here that we'll look at, because we've already seen arson and arrow slits uh, uh, in the last video I made, but uh, chieftains, the cost has been reduced by quite a lot, thankfully. It's been reduced from 700 food and 400 gold to 400 food and 300 gold. So this is quite a big difference, quite a big change. And it, I think that's a good thing because the Vikings um, unique technologies cost so much. Berserker Gang and Chieftains together, along with the Elite Berserk technology, costs so much resource. Um, you know, you could upgrade for pal uh, to Paladin for, for less than that. And the Berserks are certainly not as good as Paladins. However, with this Chieftain's technology, they've also given the uh, bonus attack a buff as well by, by giving them plus one. So that basically means that with Chieftains, Berserks are now going to do even more bonus damage against Cavalry. And I already thought that Chieftains was quite effective, to be honest. I did think that those Berserks were pretty good with Chieftains researched, even without this buff. But now I actually think that um, that's, a, that's really good for the Vikings. That's really good for the Vikings' land. And for all of those people out there who say, ah, oh, the Vikings need to get um, Halberdier, they really need that. I think the answer here is why not just buff Chieftains enough to make the Berserks do the job of the Halberdier. And I think with this technology now as it is with this change, that's great, and I think the Berserks are going to actually be pretty damn good versus Cavalry. So, like I said, I didn't want to go into too much detail in the scenario with all these things, because there's a lot of changes here, and I didn't want this video to go on for hours and hours and hours. And like I said, I'll be looking at uh, all of the new African Kingdom's civilizations very soon, in much depth, but uh, I wanted to go over this list of changes first, because it's a lot here and it's important that we understand this and have a good knowledge of these changes before looking at the African Kingdom civs in my opinion because uh, we now know that the base game has changed in quite a big way and even if you're not playing the African Kingdoms even if you're sticking to AOF for a while this is going to make the meta game a lot more interesting it's going to give civs more options and that is ultimately what it's all about so thank you very much for watching guys uh, make sure you come and tune into the stream today i'll be streaming at i think it's 6 p.m gmt if you're watching right now uh, when the video goes out if you're watching this way in the future hello to you and um, come and tune into the stream whenever anyway uh, twitch.tv forward slash zero empires because i'll be showing off these new changes and playing some games with you guys in the community game streams that we do so thank you very much for watching as always i've been zach and i'll see you guys next time